be sent to everyone. Yeah. There we are. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so in, in talking to members, it's very clear that high energy costs, price volatility, security supply all figure very highly in the in the list of headaches. Um, and that situation doesn't look like settling down anytime soon with everything that's going on in the world, unfortunately. At the same time, businesses have to deliver their part in the net zero transition. And whether these net zero targets shift a few years back or forward, that's the direction clearly set. And then in that context, we're seeing many businesses, many members from PLCs, right, who have control over their energy, um, are, who each bring their own unique specialism or insight to support that drive. And that brings me uh, to Dougie. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Dougie, who has spent over 23 years designing and developing new products for the renewables and the energy markets, including the installation of a broad range of renewable technologies. Um, uh, and more recently, his skills have been used by businesses of all backgrounds and scale as a, a genuinely independent energy consultant. And his business, Beyond Innovation, joined Scottish Engineering just earlier this year, following a recommendation from a member um who uh, who uses uh, uh, who uses his services um Dougie takes a very unique approach to understanding the energy profile of of your company before building a technology roadmap to begin to reduce reliance on grid power while also preparing for the the transition to electric vehicles um his clients include PLCs local businesses SMEs and certainly, I know he'd be keen to follow up with you if that's of interest after today's webinar to look at building your own bespoke technology roadmap uh, and associated energy reduction strategy. So on, on that note, I'll, uh, I'll pass pass on to Dougie. Thanks very much, John. Um, welcome everyone this morning and uh, thanks for taking the time out to to be included in this webinar. So what I'm going to do here is just, I'll just share my screen um, a couple of slides to go through. Not a great, not not, not a huge uh, number of slides. Oops. Share screen. Right. Um, yes. Beyond innovation. Who are we? Um, we are a company which started off just as a sole trader back in two thousand. Uh, by two thousand and eight, uh, we incorporated. And I started in 2000, having come from the wider computer electronics background, the usual digital equipment corporation, IBM, uh, AVEX Electronics, Motorola, all these types of companies. And in 2000, I decided to, to go alone because I was designing lots of products and uh, improving um, lots of systems and, and things for various companies I've worked for in the past. So in 2000, I decided to go alone. And I started inventing and innovating new products for the renewable space at that time. Um, in 2008, we incorporated, and by that time, I had designed over 100 products for the renewables industry, mostly ranging from small-scale wind turbines, blades for wind turbines, control systems for turbines, hydro turbines, a whole range of hydro turbines, um, LED torches, LED headlights, uh, lots of products for the outdoor enthusiast, for people that go hill walking at weekends, that type of stuff. So unwittingly, I was gaining a lot of experience in the, the, the wider renewables industry. I then built a team of installers to begin to install some of the products that I had designed and developed, but also just the general products that were around at the time, solar PV installations, both ground mounted, roof mounted, that type of thing. Um, I also, during that time, uh, in 2013, decided to build my own house, and it's where my business runs from. And I decided by that point, because I was heavily involved in the renewable space, I would make that property one of the most energy efficient properties in Scotland. So when it was built in 2013, it, it was built with an EPC rating of 102, uh, which is an A-plus rating. 
And I learned a lot from doing that. Uh, in particular, I made the decision to ensure that I was as self-sufficient as possible uh, with solar PV, wind turbine, solar thermal, air source heat pumps, split air con systems, uh, all the technologies you, you could ever imagine were all in that build. Um, shortly after that, I moved into buying my first electric vehicle, uh, which exposed me to the electric vehicle charging market, which at the time included one installer who was based in the D. So I then began to explore what the EV market was doing and ended up delivering training courses for 16 of the UK's leading EV charging companies. Um, so I've trained over 250 electrician companies who wanted to upskill to become EV charging companies. And I did that for a good four or five years. So unwittingly, that experience led me to being poached by various companies to consult for them because at no point was I ever tied to any particular manufacturer or supplier of any equipment. So that independence allowed me to offer completely impartial advice to clients. And since then, I've been sought after by all sorts of clients from all sorts of backgrounds. And so that's really how I got into what I'm doing. When I engage with clients, and hopefully I get to engage with each of you at the end of this uh, or following this webinar, the first thing I look at is what's, what does the energy profile of your business look like? In other words, if you were trying to describe to me or to anyone else how do you consume energy, what would that look like? Even in a, a simple graphical form, how would you describe when you're consuming power, to what extent you're consuming power, and what the timing of that looks like. Now, the way that I do that when I engage with a client is not just looking at things like half-hourly power consumption data, which not everyone has because that's determined by the size of the grid connection you've got, but I ask lots of questions around what's your shift patterns, um, what type of equipment is, is used within the business, et cetera. And from that, I build up a very clear picture, or as clear a picture as possible, as to what your energy profile looks like. Now, with that, without that, without having that energy profile, I've got no way of knowing, and you've got no way of knowing, uh, what level of problem you've got to deal with. You may have just a big electricity bill that you're complaining about and you're trying to get rid of it. But unless you know what sort of mess you're in, it's very difficult to come up with a strategy to get out of that mess. So the very first thing I do is I don't look at technologies like solar or wind or hydro or whatever initially. I look at what does your energy profile look like and therefore what, um, what technology or which technologies are best suited to sorting your profile to get your business from where it is today to where you want it to be tomorrow. Now, along that, along that route, there's going to be lots of questions. For example, um, and I'll come to this just in, in, in a few minutes. For example, does your business have fleet vehicles and are those vehicles electric? Have you considered those vehicles being electric? Or have you considered the effect of employees who decide off their own back to switch to electric vehicles? What's that going to do to your business? Now, you might think, well, what's the decision got to do with us at all? Uh, many businesses are finding that they're losing employees because they're taking the attitude that employees, if they decide to switch to electric vehicle, for example, it's that's their decision and it's up to them to figure out how they're going to charge the vehicle to turn up to work. Now, depending on where your business is, where your employees drive to and from to get to and from work, and depending on where your employees live. For example, if they live in a, a tenement in Glasgow, then clearly they're not going to be able to charge their car at home unless there's an on-street charger right outside the tenement building, which is highly unlikely. So having a good understanding of what your employees are doing and the effect of the decisions of what your employees decide to do in terms of switching to electric vehicles, that can have an impact on businesses. And I see it all the time in the provision of providing electric vehicle charging at the business to support employees that make the switch, for example. Once I've built an energy profile for your business, what I, what I then look at is which technologies best suit taking your profile from where it is today to where you want it to be tomorrow. Whether you're under pressure from your suppliers or from your customers to have a carbon reduction strategy, or whether you just want to reduce your reliance on the grid, 
Building a technology roadmap is the best way to achieve the best outcome. And using data gathered from the energy profile and from a live data feed from the technology that gets installed allows informed decisions to be made throughout the entire process of implementing your technology roadmap. Now, that's not generally what businesses do when they're looking at reducing their reliance on the grid, for example. Most companies that have got a big electricity bill that I've met will look at their roof space and say, oh, we've got a roof that faces roughly south. Let's phone a solar company and we'll see if we can get some solar panels fitted. That's a great way of getting things wrong. If you involve a solar company, a solar company is going to come in. They're going to look at your roof. They're going to look at the size of your grid connection. They're then going to tell you that the DNO, DNO meaning District Network Operator, Scottish Power or SSE if they're in Scotland, the DNO may have grid constraints in your area, and therefore the solar installer is going to say things like, yes, the DNO is going to limit your grid connection capacity for self-generation to 50 kilowatts. Therefore, we can't fit more than about 60, 65 kilowatts of PV onto your roof and connect it to the grid because the DNO won't allow you. That's utter nonsense. If you're looking at deploying renewable technology, yes, there may be a conversation to be had with the DNO, depending on how you're going to install that technology and what you're going to use the power for. So one of the first things that, that, that I look at is, what's the size of your grid connection? What does your energy profile look like? And what are the likely limitations that are going to be imposed on you by the DNO? Now, typical limitations are you're either limited to 50 kilowatts, 100, 200, whatever it's going to be. You might also be told that you can't export power. So it might be a zero export contract that you have to enter into the DNO, which means you need systems designed which maximize your self-consumption on site. And more importantly, I aim to achieve a very high level of self-sufficiency. Now, self-consumption and self-sufficiency are two completely different things. I'll give you an example. When you install solar panels on the roof of your property, you'll be given an estimate from the, uh, the solar installer as to how much of the power that's going to be produced annually from the solar PV array that you'll consume real time through your business. That's, that's self-consumption. So for example, if you install a very small amount of solar PV, but you're a heavy energy user, you could have 100% self-consumption because all the power that's being produced real time, you'll be consuming. But 100% self-consumption might only represent 1% of your total bill. So self-sufficiency is a far better terminology to use when you're looking at reducing your reliance on the, on the, on the grid, for example. The solar companies don't tend to talk about self-sufficiency, they talk about self-consumption, which can be very misleading because the percentages of self-consumption can be very high percentage figures while the percentage of self-reliance can be very low. So my job is to just cut through all the information or misinformation in many cases that you can be given by various types of installers who, let's face it, their job is to sell what's in their van. It's not to give you best advice. Some of them will give you best advice. Others will just look at the size of your roof, look at the size of your grid connection and think, well, this is this will be a good one. This is... This is going to be a big installation. We'll get to sell lots of solar panels here. And very rarely will they stand behind their claims around self-consumption or even self-sufficiency for that matter. So building a technology roadmap is fraught with many difficulties. And because I'm not tied to anyone, I'm not tied to solar installers, battery installers, EV charge point installers, I'm not tied to any of these people. And it doesn't matter to me whether you take on board the advice I give, but I work with clients who want to work with me because they want to know the mess they're in, they want to, want to know how to get out of that mess, and they want to do it by, able to, by being able to vet the information that they've already been told or that they've Googled. So that's essentially how a technology roadmap works. Invariably, and in, in more recent years, I've realised, and I've, I've worked heavily on this one because it's 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 had to be done because of DNO grid constraints. Because the national grid doesn't want people injecting power willy nilly onto the grid, quite often DNOs are now I'll refer back to DNOs, district network operators. 
DNOs, Scottish Power and SSE, are very wary about generation being injected onto their grid. And in several, several parts of the country, there are heavy constraints where they pretty much won't allow pretty much anything to be connected to the grid. And as such, that limits what most clients, especially heavy energy consumption clients, believe that they're going to be allowed to do in terms of what the DNO tells them they're allowed to, to, to do by, by means of connecting to the grid. Custom microgrids are completely different. A custom microgrid is like your own personal power station. It gets installed at site, it's built off site and drop shipped to your site. It's your own personal power station. It's built into typically an ISO shipping container, 10 foot, 20 foot shipping container, for example. And on the left hand picture there, you'll see a typical interior of a 20 foot shipping container with a custom microgrid built into it. Inside that container is all the equipment required to generate your own power. Now, because it's your own power, you can do what you like in terms of the amount of solar PV, any wind wind input from wind turbines. If you're lucky enough to have a stream or a river going past you and you can have hydro turbines, then that power can also be injected into the microgrid. Possibly even combined heat uh, and power systems, CHP systems, for example, or even just a generator that runs in biodiesel or HVO. Either way, your microgrid is your own personal power station. You throw power at it from all renewable sources and you take power from it in preference to anything that would come from the grid. The grid is therefore the backup to your own microgrid. And in cases where there's heavy grid constraints, we can set up or I can design a microgrid system which will only import power, therefore doesn't is not, is not subject to uh, the constraints of the DNOs. So for any item that just imports power, you don't need permission for the DNO to import power. Uh, I don't know anyone that's ever phoned up Scottish Power and said, I'm about to boil my kettle, can I do that, thanks? Or can I do that, please? So having a, a custom microgrid that has ability to import only and doesn't have the ability to, to export power to the grid is of no interest to the grid. The grid's only interested in parallel connections to the grid where generation could interfere with the local grid. So custom microgrids can be designed in many different ways. Some are designed to supplement a weak grid. So for example, if you've got a, a fairly weak grid infrastructure connected to your, your building and you want to expand your business, most people will phone Scottish Power or whoever and say, can I get a bigger grid connection, bigger transformer, because I want to do more. There's possibly no need to do that in many cases with your own custom microgrid. Microgrid can make up the shortfall that your grid connection can't uh, deliver, allowing, for example, a single phase supply to be turned into a three phase supply through a microgrid, or a split phase supply turned into a three phase supply through a microgrid. So they're very versatile. They allow you to pretty much do what you like when it comes to renewables without having to worry about the constraints that the DNO might otherwise impose upon your business. Once a microgrid has been designed for your business, not that I'm saying microgrid will be for everyone, but invariably that's kind of how it ends up. Hold on, somebody else has just entered. Um, invariably that's how it ends up. So once a microgrid exists for your business, it's, it's gathering real-time data from all the equipment that's connected to the microgrid, and it also looks at how you're consuming power real-time. I then use that information to make informed decisions on how to expand the microgrid, expand the amount of renewables, the amount of battery storage, et cetera, that's within the microgrid, to hit what I would deem as the sweet spot for your business. And the sweet spot is where you spent as much money as cleverly as possible as you can for the best possible bang for the buck. Now, that's not generally what people do. Uh, generally, I'm introduced to clients who have already installed solar PV. They've noticed that their bills haven't changed very much and they wonder why. I then come in, we look at what you've already installed. I then work out what your profile looks at that point or looks like at that point. We then either monitor what's already installed to work out how well it's actually performing and how much more of a benefit you would get from your already installed uh, system if you install your own custom microgrid. 
So there's there's lots of there's lots of benefits to having clarity of data before you make any informed decisions for your business. And if you're not going to follow, if you're not going to follow your own data and your own business to make your own decisions, then whose data are you planning to follow? So it's a very unique approach. It's not something I come across. I don't meet anyone that goes through this process and has made informed decisions around uh, almost any data in some cases. Um, but again, the renewables industry is there to sell their wares. My job is to make sure that the appropriate wares are installed and they're installed for the right reasons and to the right degree. I mentioned earlier on about electric vehicles. Whether we like it or not, whether you agree with electric vehicles or whether you drive electric or not, sooner or later we'll all be driving electric vehicles. It's just the nature of how the car industry is going. So whether or not the 2035 ban on sale of new petrol and diesel cars comes to fruition in 2035 or whether the next government backtracks and goes back to 2030, who knows? Immaterial of that or irrespective of that, switching to electric vehicles can make good financial sense for businesses. Depends what the business is and what the business does. It's the same as individuals. For some people driving electric vehicles, like myself, for example, it makes financial sense because I run a business, I make profit, I pay corporation tax, I get allowances for driving electric vehicles, therefore it makes sense to drive electric vehicles through my business. It also costs virtually nothing for me to charge my vehicles because I generate all my own power, virtually all my own power. So it becomes a very cheap watering exercise. And electric vehicles are just good fun, simple as that. But they're not for everyone. I'm not going to suggest that everyone should just go out and buy an electric vehicle. But I will discuss with you, as a business owner, the benefit of not just switching fleet vehicles to electric, but encouraging employees through, for example, salary sacrifice schemes to make the switch to electric vehicles when the time's right. A salary sacrifice scheme, for example, saves you, the employer, money. It saves you, employer's national insurance. It saves the employee personal tax and personal national insurance because they're taking an effective cut in salary, which sounds horrific, but has a far better outcome than the employee earning the money, paying tax and national insurance, and then going out and buying an electric vehicle. So for key employees, a salary sacrifice scheme is a great way to retain those employees. But I can cover all that in, in more detail if I engage with you in, 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 after this uh, webinar. Either way, I help lots of different types of businesses with their strategy around how they're going to make the switch to electric vehicles or how they're going to deal with their employees making the switch to electric vehicles. If employees are going to be expecting to be charging their vehicle at your workplace, it's going to be the bills up. You're going to be chewing through more electricity on a grid connection that's maybe already strained. But you need to know that that's going to happen. You also need to know things like if you decide to install EV charge points in your car park today, whose kit are you going to install? Why are you going to install that particular kit? And the best way to get that wrong is to invite an EV charging company in to pitch to you. Because unwittingly, you'll have picked the best EV charging company that there is in the country. And they happen to have the best chargers because that's the ones that's in the back of their van. The reality is, it's almost impossible to pick the right kit. Fortunately, because I've been running training courses for the past five years on a broad variety of kits, I can tell you what's going to work and what's not going to work. Because it doesn't matter to me, but it matters to you. So I'll tell you what's going to work, what's not going to work, and what's on the horizon that would otherwise spoil the show for you. And I'll give you an example of that. At the moment, HMRC doesn't consider EV charging at the workplace as a benefit in kind. Now, that's not going to last long. HMRC is not going to miss a trick here as the number of vehicles uh, that are basically being given free electricity at the workplace while the business is claiming tax relief on the electricity that's being purchased through the business. So sooner or later, HMRC will impose benefit and kind calculations on the charging sessions that take place at a workplace. Unless you've installed the right EV charging kit, they can identify the individual and the vehicle that took the charge at the charging session point, then you won't have the data to then create the reports that are required for HMRC benefit and kind calculations. That simple change of rules by HMRC will spoil many of the installations that have already taken place up and down the country. And I know that because I know the kit that's been installed in most cases. 
So having an EV strategy makes perfect sense for your business. And whether you agree with the transition to electric vehicles or not, it will be imposed upon you. So you're best to have that as part of your overall strategy. So building a roadmap isn't about just the technologies from a renewables perspective or from a micro bit perspective. It's about how do you cope with all the things that are on the horizon that will otherwise trip you up, that you don't know they're coming. That's my job. My job is to know what's coming, warn you what's coming, and prepare you for what's coming to make sure that at every stage you have no surprises. There's nothing worse in business than having a surprise. So my job is to remove those surprises, minimise your reliance on the grid, and where possible make you fully self-sufficient. Now, it's very difficult to make a business fully self-sufficient. It all depends on your energy profile, when you're consuming energy and to what extent. But I have done it. I've been approached by companies who have said, we need to disconnect from the grid. We don't want this £11 a day standing charge that we've just been quoted, for example. And we, we just simply want to disconnect and be self-sufficient from this point onwards and never have a bill again. It is possible. It, 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 it can be quite tricky at times, but it is possible, and I have done it. The best way, I think, to, to demonstrate what microgrids do and, and the clarity of data that they provide is for me to, to show you a live system. So give me a second and I shall stop that share. And I may have been a slicker way of doing this. There we go. Hopefully you can see that now. Um, this is a farm called Broom Park Farm. This is where a, a custom microgrid was designed earlier this year. This is a farm that was chewing through 150,000 kilowatts of power per year. And they're a robotic dairy farm. So they've got robots that are milking 24-7 and cows that decide when they need milk to themselves and just walk themselves into the machine and be milked. It's quite impressive to watch. However, I've never seen a robotic milking parlour before it was referred to this particular farm. So I had no idea what was in store. Now this, this farm in question was paying 17 pence a kilowatt for electricity. They happened to come out of a fixed contract at a really bad time and ended up paying 66 pence daytime tariff and just under 60 pence uh, in the uh, evening and overnight tariff. So their bill went from being very manageable to around 55 to 60,000 pounds a year or it was going to. I then got a phone call to say, look, uh, I understand you know uh, how to solve these kinds of problems. Can you come and have a look? So I designed a, a microgrid system here that was deliberately too small to meet all their needs because it didn't have clarity of data to know exactly how a robotic dairy farm operates. And they only had a split phase supply, so there was no half hourly data. You need to be on a supply that's greater than 69 kVA, which is a 100 amp three phase supply, before you'll have half hour the data. So, because of a split phase supply, there's no half hour the data. So, I had very little to work on apart from some logged data that I created after a couple of days of putting a data logger on site. However, that, however, that didn't tell me what a whole year would look like. And because the farm was already on 66p by that point, daytime tariff, we were under pressure to get a system designed. So I made some estimations and suggested that a, a microgrid of around 50% of what I expected would be the final size of microgrid be installed. So I designed that and then employed the services of an external contractor that is a microgrid specialist. And I work with lots of different types of companies that are experts in their field so that I can bring in people that really know what they're doing to implement a technology roadmap. So that microgrid was installed, and this is the live feed from that particular farm. Now the DNO in this case, who is Scottish Power, insisted that there was a zero export. So this system is not allowed to export power. So you can't sell power to the grid to make um, any money with this system. So this system has to maximize self-consumption and maximize the level of self-sufficiency at the same time because there's no way of exporting power. So you'll notice in the top left-hand corner, you, you get the grid input, and you'll see the L1 and L2 are showing a voltage, and there's no, no current coming in in L2 at the moment. So coming into the system at this point, there's about 38 watts, so virtually no power can off the grid. 
this system is set up to have two different protected or two different circuits. One is protected and one is not. And what I mean by that is critical loads, which is this, this box up here, which is about 11 kilowatts going through it at the moment. That critical load is pretty much the entire farm. It's all the milking robots. Now, I don't know whether you know this, but cows can't reverse. If a cow walks into a milking robot machine and is, is attached to the machine, the last thing you want is a power cut when a cow is attached to a milking machine because they don't know there's a power cut and you can't tell them to reverse. And besides, there's a cow standing behind it and it can't be told to reverse. So you just don't want a power cut. So having the entire farm and all the milking robots on a critical load on a microgrid prevents power cuts. And that gets around the problem that this farm had, which was power cuts, where they had a backup generator, which could take them up to 10 minutes to switch on in a power cut, which by that time, the cows were causing havoc within the farm. So this system got rid of a problem that I didn't even know existed on farms. So a critical load in your business might be all the circuits that you want to keep operational in a power cut if you're prone to power cuts. AC loads, this box here, it's actually just, in this particular farm, it's a few bits and bobs that the farmer doesn't mind losing in a power cut. The reality is, those bits of equipment are hardly used, and hence that's why it wasn't included in the critical needs part of the system set up. So the total consumption here is about 13 kilowatts at the moment. It's not a particularly good day. The weather is 8 degrees and it's cloudy. The PV system is actually a DC coupled PV system. And that's a terminology you won't hear very often. In fact, you won't hear it from solar installers because they don't really know what a DC coupled PV system looks like. DC coupled PV is where you take the DC power from solar panels and directly connect them to a battery storage system via a DC to DC maximum power point tracker. So you'll see in here, below the PV charger, there's a list of what's called MPPTs, these are maximum power point trackers and DC to DC converters. It's the single most efficient way of getting power from solar panels into battery storage. What most people would suggest is a pre-packaged battery storage system, a bit like a Tesla Powerwall, for example, which has got a built-in AC to DC converter and DC to AC converter. So there's conversion losses that this system here avoids. So at the moment, the batteries are sitting at not a great deal of charge because it's not a particularly good day, and we're early on in the day anyway. So the charging of those batteries is sitting at 11%. Further down here, I'll show you yesterday because day ha today hasn't lasted long enough to show you what a full day's profile looks like. This is yesterday. So as you can see, the farm from midnight is consuming 4.17 kilowatt hours of power in the first hour then 1.89, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the red bars in this graph show the energy consumption for the farm. The yellow bars are the solar PV. So as you can imagine, they don't appear at night because it's dark. So from about eight, nine o'clock in the morning, you'll see that the solar PV in this case was producing 10 kilowatts yesterday or 10.67 kilowatt hours of power in, in that half hour, sorry, that, that hour. In the next hour, 16.36 kilowatts of solar, but the consumption was only 4.46. So solar was dealing with the entire load and that spare was being used to charge the batteries. And you'll see this blue curve here. That blue curve is the percentage charge status of the batteries in this system. Now this system's got 75 kilowatts of battery storage and 80 kilowatts of DC coupled PV. So yesterday wasn't a particularly good day weather-wise, but still, Batteries got up to 56% charge at three o'clock. By that time, it's beginning to get dark. Clocks have changed before we know it's going to be dark at half three. So this system, as we approach the shortest day on the 22nd of December, will progressively produce and store less and less power. But even yesterday, to the grid, not allowed to export, so to the grid is always going to be zero or thereabouts. From the grid, they still had to bring in a shortfall of power of 37.4 kilowatt hours of power yesterday. They consumed a total of 107 kilowatt hours, 79.6 of that came from solar PV. Now that data is completely invaluable to me and to you as the client, because based on this data, all future decisions on the expansion of your microgrid will take place. Now, I'm not saying that you'll all end up with a microgrid, but you'll end up with an equivalent of this because you need this kind of data and this kind of clarity of data to make informed decisions 
around which technologies best suit your particular circumstances. Let me show you just what a typical month's um, data looks like on this. So going back to September, this is over the entire month, this is how the system performs. So you can tell by looking at this how many good, good days of weather existed. For example, these days here where the battery uh, percentage got to 100%, there's a fair chance that's because it was very good weather. When you get to the 16th and 17th, it was obviously not as good a day uh, on the 16th and 17th, and again on the, on the 28th. But buried in all this data is all the information that I require and you require to allow us to know what every month's going to look like every year, give or take, on average. And in this particular instance, the farmer's looking to achieve an overall self-sufficiency rating of around 65%. Now, in this particular month here, they achieved 87%. Month before was a great month, and that was at 94%. So 94% self-sufficiency, and that was August to September. So as you can imagine, Compared to what was lying ahead at the beginning of this year at 66 pence a kilowatt, this farm is now very heavily self-sufficient. Now, it's very difficult to use solar PV only to run a business for an entire year because solar PV produces the bulk of its power in the middle of the summer. So spring, summer and early autumn provide very good results from solar PV, combined with a microgrid, of course. Direct solar PV really has a good impact on a business, unless you run a garden centre. And I know that because I've looked at and addressed the energy profiles of over 26 garden centres in Scotland so far. Garden centres have got a very unique energy profile in that they've got a cafe, the cafe's run with people in the middle of the day, and the kitchen that supports that cafe chews through the electricity in the middle of the day. So their energy profile peaks in the middle of the day exactly when solar PV's output peaks. So solar PV has got a very good impact on garden centre energy profiles and electricity bills. Businesses don't tend to have that type of energy profile. And in fact, this farm turned out to be one of the best outcomes for a farm that I've come across because farms traditionally are not robotic milking farms. They milk cows early in the morning and late at night or early to late evening. So early in the morning and late evening, it's not the middle of the day, and you can't milk cows in the middle of the day. So installing solar PV on a traditional dairy farm rarely has a good outcome without the inclusion of a microgrid or some form of battery storage. So I've used this as an example. I'll stop sharing that for a second. I've used this as an example to demonstrate that it doesn't really matter what type of business you've got, you can't make any decisions on anything around renewables technologies or reducing your reliance on the grid or replacing a gas or oil bill with renewable generation until you know the scale of the problem you're trying to fix. That's what creating an energy profile is all about. Now, let me just go back to the slides. Um, so in, in a nutshell, that is what I do for clients. I don't approach clients directly. I'm usually referred to by other clients. So for example, as you can imagine, once I had designed that system for Broom Park Farm, dairy farm, I was referred around loads of dairy farms and I ended up doing similar types of systems for dairy farms. I had no intention of doing that. It's just the way it worked out. By the same token, I do lots of, work for engineering companies of various types, golf courses of, of all things, and, and just random types of businesses. And everyone's affected by this. And, and, and more recently it became acute during the chaos that was created from the Ukraine and Russia war. Um, the wholesale energy markets became chaotic. Energy prices became completely chaotic. And if you were really unfortunate, you would come out of a fixed contract right in the middle of that chaos and you would end up on a tariff that's pretty crippling for the business. If you were lucky enough that that didn't happen to your business, then that was 
just sheer luck. Now, luck is not a strategy. And hopefully the past 18 months of chaos has, has, has made you realise that unless you actually do something to, to proactively extract yourself from reliance on the wholesale markets of all descriptions, then this is going to happen again. And in fact, if you do nothing, energy prices on average double every 10 years, 8% compound per year. And that has been the case for decades in the past. In fact, in over the past 20 years, energy prices, electricity prices in particular, have trebled. And that's excluding the blip that happened in the past 18 months. So if you think your bill is bad now, just wait for 10 years, it'll be twice as bad. Wait for 10 years again, it'll be twice as bad again. Sooner or later, you have to break that cycle. You have to become more self-sufficient. You can't keep straining the grid and relying on the grid while complaining that your bills are going up. So let me just stop that so that you hopefully I'm not sharing anything now and you're back to seeing me. You might prefer to have been looking at the slides, certainly. But uh, in a nutshell, that's everything I do. At this point, I'd like to open the floor to anyone that's got any questions around what either I haven't covered or anything that you've got in mind that you want to discuss. Can I take the questions off? Dougie. Say again, sorry. Can I take the questions off? I'm just uh, yeah, I'm yeah. Just if you've got any questions, yeah. Just interested to know the the custom microgrid solution. It was a farm, obviously, so not quite an SM, not not a typical manufacturing business or engineering business, but but still, in principle, what sort of payback? You know, how, how many years? Or I'm just yeah. trying to get a sense because my my notion is that that a lot of businesses would see the custom microgrid as being quite a it's you know quite a capital intensive long payback yeah. deal and is that the case? Well, if you're being clever about you know, this, if you've got a bill that's, like, let's say, yeah, it, it does vary from client to client. However, what I try to do is I'll sit a client down and say, look, you're paying £5,000 a month just now to Scottish Power for your bill. I would suggest that you pay to Scottish Power £2,000 a month. And the £3,000 that you were paying to Scottish Power, although you were complaining you were doing it, pay that towards the finance of the equipment that reduce your bill by £3,000. This shouldn't cost you a penny. So in a nutshell, this shouldn't be seen as an additional capital expense to the business. This is replacing a bill with something that's generating power that takes that part of the bill out of the equation. So your overall outgoings remain the same until you own that, uh, that asset. Now, typically that takes between six and seven years. So right. you can either do nothing for this for six or seven years and pay out exactly the same amount of money as you will do by having something that in seven years you will own the technology that has removed 65% of your bill. So from that point onwards, 65% of your bill is zero. And it hasn't cost you anything more than what it would have done had you done nothing. So my job isn't to make the problem worse. It's to use the fact that, yes, you've been complaining about having a big bill and you're going to have, have to endure that same outgoing possibly for the next six to seven years to then see the real benefits of having your own custom microgrid, for example. But that's how this should be budgeted. It should be budgeted from the same budget that you're putting aside each month to pay Scottish Power or SSE or whoever your supplier is. But on that subject of paying bills, what people don't realise, if you've got a microgrid, you can get access to low-cost energy overnight. And I'll give you some examples. Octopus have got a tariff, Octopus Go and Octopus Agile. Now, Octopus Go is seven and a half pence overnight for a window from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m., I think it is. It might be slightly different. Whereas Ovo have got a 7p per kilowatt EV charging 24-hour window. So anytime in 24 hours, day or night, seven pence a kilowatt for charging electric vehicles. That's a no-brainer if you're adding EVs into the mix for your business. That would otherwise go through your chargers at 20, 30, 40p, depending on what your daytime tariff is. So my job is to make sure that, for example, if you can take advantage of an overnight 7.5p tariff and you've got a microgrid, it's not sunny at night. Therefore, you can charge the batteries from the, in your microgrid at 7.5p and use that power during the day that would otherwise be costing you 
20, 30, 40 P on your daytime tariff to run your business, supplemented by the solar PV or wind or hydro or CHP that's topping the system on your day. So this is about cleverly using a microgrid asset, not just for its primary purpose of circumventing DNO constraints or grid constraints, but using the energy company's wide and varied tariff offerings to your best benefit. So I hope that answers your question, John. But basically, yes, if 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 you're looking at the capital expenditure part of this, whether it's borrowed money or whether it's money from profits, etc., you get first year allowance on the asset. So you'll either reduce your capital, reduce your corporation tax for this financial year. If that allowance hasn't been used in this entire financial year, you can backdate up to three years, or you can carry that loss forward into future years, etc. Um, on, on average, if you take the lifespan or the typical lifespan of a microgrid, the average levelized cost of power that it will produce based on solar PV only with battery storage is about 12p flat rate. So in other words, if your energy company phoned you up tomorrow and said, we're going to put you on a 12p tariff flat rate for 65% or 75% of your bill, you'd bite their arm off. That's essentially what a microgrid does. It levelizes the cost of whatever level of self-sufficiency you want from the system at roughly 12p for the next 25 years. Okay. That's I, think, hold on. I think there was a chat. Hold on. There's, there's yeah. a question that's popped Questions up here. Questions from James. Is uh, funding available? Uh, for, for the EV charging piece of this, yes. For installing renewables, no. There's enough allowances around that uh, grants, no. EST, Energy Saving Trust Scotland, have got interest-free loans for renewables for businesses, though. So you can get access to interest-free loans. Yeah. Um, so that's always a bonus, especially if you were considering going to your bank or going to a finance company. EST is a good option on that basis, if you can be bothered filling out the paperwork and waiting for four months. But either way, yes, there is that level of support, but no grant funding as such. On the EV side of things, EV charging, you get grants from OZ, which is the Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles, which is a division of EVLA. There's grants up to about £14,000, £15,000. It's £350 per charger for 40 chargers, basically. But EST also offer up to 50% grant, but it's it's very much on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the business and what the proposition is. So between OZEV and EST, you can get quite a big chunk of your EV charging grant, uh, sorry, EV charging costs covered. You can also make the decision if you install EV chargers, you can make the decision whether you set a tariff that wipes the face of the cost of having the chargers there, so that if an employee is going to be charging at the workplace, you can set a tariff that's similar to what it would have cost had they been able to charge at home. If they happen to live in a flat, can't charge at home. And most people are paying between 26 and 28 pence a kilowatt uh, domestically at the moment. So if the business is getting its power for a levelized cost of 12p, and you know that that power is going through an EV charger, you can either set a tariff at 12p to wipe its face or set it at 20 two pence because it's considerably less than what it would have been had that person actually been able to charge it home, for example. And again, we'll have all those discussions around how to make that part work. It's really interesting because everything has a knock-on effect to everything else. You can't look at solar PV in isolation from battery storage. You can't look at battery storage in isolation from electric vehicles. And if you look at electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging today, lots of vehicles have got vehicle to grid or vehicle to home charging capabilities. Now that's going to become very, very pertinent when you've got a microgrid system and variable tariffs that you can take advantage of. It means that cars in your car park can become part of the overall energy strategy solution for the business because they, they become mobile battery storage systems that you can put power into as well as take power from. And that just, it's, it's mind blowing where all this can go, but you need to have a, a clear understanding of how everything affects everything else and how best to take advantage of all the all the nuances of each of the technologies and all the ways in which all those technologies interact with each other. And that's something that I find that very few people understand, even within the renewable space, because they don't come from a background of designing and developing 
200 products for the market and know how stuff works. Fortunately and unwittingly, I ended up doing this. It wasn't my intention. It's just the way things panned out. Any other questions? Anyone else? Okay, um, James also asked, James had also asked how much was the, I think he means the microgrid on the farm. It's, it's, just give me a second. What was the question? Sorry. Uh, James's second question was how much? All right, on, 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 on that farm, microgrid. on that farm, it was 200 and, £243,000 to install the, that first piece on that farm. And the owners are going to be extending the system in April next year when they're in a new financial year with new allowances. They're going to be extending the system to include a lot more solar and massively increase the amount of battery storage because they've now realised the value of being as self-sufficient as possible. We're using the data that's going to be gathered, especially through the next couple of months, as we approach the shortest day and then lead out of that shortest day, that's going to tell us a hell of a lot about how much extra we can add into the mix. You might be thinking, hold on a minute, if you oversize the system because you can't export on that site, what are you going to do with the spare power in the summer months? We've got a strategy for that. Robot, robot milking machines heat water for cleaning out the pipes after milking sessions and they heat it real time. Now, real time can mean when it's not sunny in the middle of the day. So what we're setting up at that particular farm is a large buffer store of hot water. So the extra heat and extra power from solar from the microgrid gets diverted into a hot water cylinder, which is then used to provide hot water to the robots, which then don't have to instantaneously heat the water up in the evening for the flushing sessions. That skews the energy usage more into the middle day window they're also fitting an ice making machine such that milk cooling is done from ice that's made in the middle of the day. And that's very energy intensive. So we've got plenty of things we can do with the spare energy that happens late spring, summer, early autumn, because we can't export. Now it's quite unusual that there's zero export. Quite often you'll get up to 50 kilowatts of export. And if that's the case, this system could export any unused power at a rate of 50 kilowatts, even if the power's coming in at a rate of 150 kilowatts into the system, because there's batteries in the system, we can spread that over production across two, three, four hours at 50 kilowatts to export it to the grid. And today you can get typically 50, 15 p, 15 pence a kilowatt to export to the grid. But in my opinion, you're far better to offset something that's costing you 66 pence than trying to sell it for 15. Because you have to sell five times as much at 15p to offset what you've just bought in at 66. So best to be as self-sufficient as possible, use as much of your own power as possible and offset as much of that incoming tariff as possible than trying to sell power to the grid because you've got no control over wholesale export costs. And the wholesale export market at the moment is so skewed that the export tariff's 15 pence. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on that remaining at 15 pence for long. When the market settles down a bit, that that price will become less than some incoming tariffs. And some people that have been listening to this today has probably already worked out seven and a half pence overnight from Octopus Gold is less than 15 pence export. And you're damn right. You can take power off the grid at seven and a half pence at night and sell it back to the grid for 15 pence during the day. Seriously, you can do that. There's nothing to prevent you doing that, providing you've got an ENO connection permission that allows your export. You'll discover that I, I love this stuff. I mean, I've done nothing but this for 23 years. I don't know anything else. I do this seven days a week. I'm enthusiastic about it. I love it. And I love the challenge that clients bring to the table. And every client brings something really unique to the table. And I get pitched some really tricky stuff to fix. But I love doing it. And I like the challenge of getting it right. And we are dealing with the sorts of money that we're talking about here. You've got to get it right. So you have to gather the data, make informed decisions, and take it in stages. Don't jump in with two feet and try and get it right first time. It will never work. It will never happen. And I would never recommend doing that. Start with smaller systems. Use the data to build the system up to get to the sweet spot for your business. And then keep tabs on where that sweet spot needs to move to as the business evolves. And in a, in a nutshell, John, that's pretty much yep. everything I wanted to cover. 
Well, thanks very much. Thank, thanks to, to those who were able to come along. Uh, and please get in touch uh, directly with uh, with Dougie if you want to follow up, have that discussion. We uh, in Scottish Engineering, you know, we, we love to see member companies working with each other. And we think uh, we think Dougie brings uh, quite a unique insight into this whole area, and we would we would be very keen for anybody looking at these issues uh, to pick up with them. And also, please tell please tell your colleagues in other parts of the business or other member companies as well. Um, Dougie, I think we're hoping to share the the, the recording. Yes, so I'm going to um, stop recording at the end of this and okay. then hopefully uh, that will generate a link that you can go to somewhere. I've never done it, so I don't know what happens. So let's see what I'm, happens at the end of I'm this. I'm hoping my colleague Sarah uh, will be able to pick that stuff up <laughs> and make that link available somehow. Yes, yes, very good. Listen, yeah. everyone, th 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 thanks very much for participating this morning and to, to listening. I know it's a lot to take in and your head will be buzzing. Uh, can you imagine with my wife? <laughs> Thinks at the end of every every day, she says, "My head's bursting." Yeah, I have that effect in people. But I'm looking forward to the prospect of meeting you in due course. Dougie at BeyondInnovation.co.uk is my email address. Drop me an email, and uh, we'll engage in, and, and and let's see what let's see what comes of it. No obligation on your part. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for no problem. Thanks now. Cheers now. Bye now. Bye.